please welcome Henny to the stage to deliver the closing keynote, The Velvet Rope. Thank you. Good afternoon, NUX. Have you had a good day? Yes, good. Um, God, there's a lot of you, isn't there? Luckily for you, there's just one of me, and I am the only thing that stands between you and your first beer of the day. Assuming it is the first beer of the day. Um, so I'm Henny Swan. I work at the Passiello Group, and we are a very small consultancy who, in a nutshell, do accessibility end-to-end. -end. Um, user experience, development, testing, developing, the whole caboodle. But as Gavin said, in a previous life, I worked at BBC in the accessibility team there. And as part of my remit, I had to manage the BBC Accessibility Complaints Inbox. Four words, quite frankly, you never want to hear in one sentence. Um, even just two of those, BBC Complaints, is enough. And actually, most of the complaints that we had were unrelated to accessibility. I think my favourite one was... Um, Dear BBC, why did you kill off Lady Mary's husband in Downton Abbey? <laughs> ah, dear viewer, wrong channel. Um, but there was a 10%, I, I reckon, of um, feedback from disabled users, which I began to really, really love reading and curating. It used to be, you know how on Friday afternoons you might kind of do something you fancy doing at work? I would go and delve in the inbox. Um, and the reason why I loved that was because I learned so much about how disabled people used our products. And that's how I met Colin. Now, I got to know Colin quite well over my first few weeks at BBC. I found out that he was in his late 60s. He was retired. Um, not the kind of guy who took retirement sitting down by, by any means. You know, he was a busy guy. He, had, he still had kind of a couple of work projects on the go. He was a family man. But he was an EastEnders fan, an avid EastEnders fan. But as he was busy, he didn't always manage to watch it of an evening. So he would go to iPlayer. Not every week, but occasionally he'd, he'd go to iPlayer and go and catch up on what he'd missed. Colin happened to be blind as well. Now, I, he, he'd been blind, I think, probably all of his life. And he seemed incredibly comfortable in his skin and was in no way defined by his disability. Um, and part of being blind meant when he comes to iPlayer or other project, uh, products online, he would use a screen reader. Now, a screen reader does pretty much what it says on the tin. It reads everything out that's on screen. So as a screen reader user, you can use your keyboard and tab around the page, and you can focus on focusable elements like form inputs, text links, images of text, etc., and they'll get read out to you. They'll get read out to you, but they'll also be identified as a link. They'll be announced as a link as well. Or you can use keyboard shortcuts, so you can jump around parts of the page. So you'd have a keyboard shortcut that would bring up a list of headings in the page. You can then listen to the headings, choose where you want to jump to in the page, and then start listening to the page from there. Now, the reason why Colin had emailed in was because he could not find EastEnders on iPlayer. That was a red flag. EastEnders, one of the flagship programs, what was going on? So this is back when um, it was iPlayer version 3. And I'm sorry about the contrast here. Um, but what we've got on screen is the old iPlayer. So we've got at the top the BBC Global Navigation, followed by iPlayer Navigation, <coughs> which has tabs for TV and radio. And then you have on the iPlayer Navigation TV favorites, um, more items, expiring, manage button. <laughs> You then have this accordion across the top of the page, an accordion with four panels and four headings for those panels, which are featured for you. I'm going to have to look at this screen, aren't I? Um, most popular and friends. <laughs> Underneath that, you have a TV channel's heading, and then you have information about the channels and the schedule, and then you have the categories section, where you can let go through films, latest, and so on. Now, you probably can't see it. Um, kind of appropriate, but uh, EastEnders is under the most popular channel. But he couldn't, uh, he couldn't find it. 
So I emailed some instructions like, navigate to this heading and do this and do that. And he still couldn't find it. And we would got to know each other fairly well by this point. And I knew he was a fairly proficient screen reader user. I couldn't work out what was going on. So I said, OK, let's get on the phone and we'll, we'll both have our screen readers running and we'll navigate through the page. The minute I did that, it became blindingly obvious, oh dear, that, um, I didn't mean to say that, that um, the page was really, really not particularly usable for Colin. So let's have a look at the few reasons why. Multiple headings with updating copy. Now I mentioned that a screen reader user navigates a page uh, by using shortcuts, and one of those shortcuts is to bring up a list of headings and you can jump around the page. Now the problem was that the obvious headings of most popular for you channels categories were marked up correctly, but all the programs in the page were also presented as a heading. So instead of having a list of, say, six key headings, he had a list of like 40. So the heading structure became all but um, pointless. And also of that 40 headings, most of them were headings that updated, the copy updated almost on a daily basis. So there was no way that he could get a mental map of the page that was consistent and familiar when he came back to the page. Equally, there were duplicated links to the same page. So we have here a thumbnail for a program called Crash, and then we have the title of that program, which is Crash. Both of those are links. Both of them were slightly different editorial. So when Colin listened to these, he was like, well, which one goes to the playback page? Which one is the program? They were just slightly differently worded, and it was confusing. Not to mention the fact that what was, say, 30 links then becomes 60 links, which is pretty cumbersome to uh, navigate through. Primary content was far down in the content order. TV channels and categories. I would say that's probably the most important um, headings or, or areas of a, of a TV viewing site that you really want to get to. And categories was, in fact, where he was going. That's where he went to to find EastEnders. But there was a problem. So we've zoomed in on the categories. And what happened was that he'd go to Drama and Soaps. I've actually got latest highlighted here. And he'd click on it, fully expecting to be taken to the page which listed Drama and Soaps. But what happened was it populated the right-hand side with four of the latest Drama and Soaps, but not took it, take him to the page. And if it's not, if it, if he didn't even know that it had updated, number one. And number two, perhaps the thing, you know, that he was looking for wasn't in that four. What he didn't know was that you had to click on that link a second time to get taken through to the next page. Weird. So what do these issues have in common? Well, they're not accessibility issues, which is a problem. The site had, in fact, been recently audited to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are the de facto guidelines for web accessibility that all governments, all countries follow. And the BBC have their own subset of guidelines, um, which are based on WCAG, as it's known. Well, all of these issues were, in fact, usability issues. They slipped through the gaps of WCAG. But there were usability issues that were so significant that they created an absolute barrier of access. So for Colin, he was tantalizingly, tantalizingly close to where he wanted to be, but he was just stuck behind that velvet rope. Your name's not down, you're not coming in. So what does a disabled person want when they're using your products? Compliance with WCAG? Support for Wayaria? Wayaria is a, a code spec that uh, works with HTML to make uh, rich internet applications more accessible. So it plugs the gaps that HTML doesn't have in terms of supporting people with screen readers, getting notifications that, for example, a show hide widget is open or closed or a slider um, is moving, etc. So what does a disabled person want? Compliance with WCAG, support for Wayaria, page validation. Has anyone launched a site and there's somebody in some dark corner of the internet going, yeah, yeah, but your page doesn't validate. It's going to fail. It's going to fail WCAG. And then an accessibility policy. I think we spend a lot of time 
writing accessibility policies where we talk about compliance and WCAG and WayArea and page validation. And it's just a form of showing off and it's just a form of talking to other people in the industry to say, hey, look at us, look what we did. It doesn't help the end user. What does a disabled person want is the right question, but I think we've been giving it the wrong answers. What we need is accessible user experience. Now, this is the new shiny, it's the new black, it's the new hashtag, it's the thing that if you're worth your weight in gold as an accessibility consultant, you have to throw it out there into conversation. But it's not new, and it's something that, um, despite being the new shiny, is unbelievably important because if we have compliance with guidelines, it does not guarantee that you'll have a site that people with disabilities can, in fact, use. Design, architecture, features, content strategy, if they are all developed in isolation from thinking about how to include diverse users, your site will fail. Not just for those diverse users, but I fundamentally believe it will be a really bad user experience for all of your users. So as the idea makers, the innovators, the artists and the thinkers, it's down to you to start bringing this into your design thinking, into your con concepts and ideas. Jared Smith put it quite well in a very short article. There's probably only about five articles on accessibility I'd ever recommend you go and read if you really want to get the skinny on it, and this is one of them. Applying accessibility techniques to an unusable site is like putting lipstick on a pig. No matter how much you apply, it will always be a pig. And this is so true. I mean, I work with clients every day, and I work on the UX end, I work on the remediation end, I work on the consultancy side, and the only time I say I cannot make this accessible is when the design is fundamentally broken. Because what happens is this, if you have a bad design that goes to development, the developers then have to do hacks to try and make it work. And hacky code is invariably going to be problematic. So what can happen is you can, you can do a hack to make a bad design work, but it's going to be probably non-standard in how a user experiences it, especially someone who is using a keyboard, as a screen reader user might. Um, or perhaps somebody with voice input software, where you use your voice to navigate. <coughs> web developer Ian Pouncey said, it pains me to say this, but web developers may not be the most important people when it comes to making accessible websites and apps. And I think he's right. And actually, I blame Ian, in part, for what's happened. I ran this slide past him, it's okay. He's not going to lynch me later. He was one of those web developers in the early noughties who understood web standards and understood the importance of web accessibility. So he just did it. He just built it into the products that he was working on. And he's worked on some fairly significant products, which you've probably all used in your time. Yahoo homepage, the BBC Global Navigation. He was very much of a do it now, ask for forgiveness later. But what he would do is he would take designs which wouldn't always completely work, and he would just try and fix them as best he could when it came to coding. And I think as a result of that, we've not really given enough focus on good design, inclusive design. But Ian's not the only person to blame. I am to blame, and people like me are also to blame. Because again, throughout the early noughties, what did we do? We spent our lives remediating, auditing, filing bugs, against existing sites and apps, which is really not ever going to fix the web. It's never going to make it better. It's just going to fix those sites, well, some of those sites that come to us. The other problem with that is by auditing, you are invariably following the web content accessibility guidelines. And there's really not much in there or not enough in there to accommodate good design. We have color contrast, color and meaning, visible focus states, stuff like that. But that's not enough. That's absolutely not enough. Guidelines are important. I don't want you to walk away and think, she just dissed WCAG. Woohoo, I don't have to worry about it. They are important, but they're a framework. They're not an end point. They're a framework from which we all need to work. And I think the problem for me is guidelines tend to focus over, over code, over design, as I've said. Does, it, does the code meet the spec, rather than does the design 
accommodate what people need to do. They tend to focus on output over outcome. So again, does it pass WCAG? Does it pass a test? As opposed to, can that person complete that task? Can that person with dyslexia, can that person with autism, can that person who um, is deaf and doesn't speak um, English as a first language, but BSL, British Sign Language, can that person understand the copy or what that label is saying on that button? So as a result, compliance trumps experience. And we all know that um, Trump is a bad word. <laughs> Something for both our American friends and our UK friends. Um, so what I want you to think about as I go through this talk is design, outcome, and experience. And I want you to think about it in the context of someone you know who might have a disability. It could be somebody in your family, it could be a friend, it could be a co-worker, it could be Stevie Wonder. I don't care. But have someone in mind if you can. So if the guidelines aren't enough, how do we, the thinkers, the artists, the designers, how do we get there? How do we create an accessible user experience? And for me, it comes down to accessible UX principles. And I know it's like another subset of sort of guidelines, but it's really a, a design thinking. Now, there's no, there's no kind of de facto sets of accessible UX principles, but I've kind of developed my own over time based on the BBC How to Design for Accessibility Guidelines in the BBC Global Experience Language, which I, I pretty much put together. Also, the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkits, which is a beautiful read. I really strongly encourage you to go and read that. And a book, A Web for Everyone, by Sarah Horton and Whitney Quesenbrough. So my, my kind of principles really are drawn from those, those three sources. And my principles are these. People first, equivalence, choice, control, consistency, and value. Value is my favorite, and I was very happy to see that Boone talked about value, because this is, this is really the crux of where we're at. So let's have a look at those. People first. Place the needs of people above the needs of technology. Well, of course, we should be doing that. We all know that. But we're dealing with legacy content. SharePoint 2007 was mentioned earlier. Um, I don't know how many people have been in that kind of situation where it's painful. It's so, so painful to be dealing with, with existing complex legacy content that you, you don't even know how to begin to un unravel the code and why the code is like this and not like that. So immediately what happens is you're not thinking about people first, you're thinking about code and compliance. Um, and you're thinking about bugs and remediation and, and, and how we can make things better and how we can put elastoplast over it and everything. Um, the other is procurement. This is a really important part of, uh, the, of the process. We need to be thinking about what people want in terms of how we're procuring, procuring software, patent libraries, all of that kind of thing. Um, and I've seen so many RFPs and so many contracts where somebody has obviously just shoved in that line of, must be compliant with WCAG, but nobody who's put that contract together or, or sent out that RFP actually knows how to how to measure success or whether that is possible or how to assess a potential vendor in terms of making uh, their content accessible. We then have third-party content, much of a similar thing. We have, I mean, our websites and web apps are made up of, of third-party content. And quite often when we're doing auditing at my company, we'll have a maps or um, a shopping basket that's not owned by the particular company, and they're like, well, there's nothing we can do to make that more accessible because we don't own it. Um, but to the end user, they don't know that. You know, it's, it's in your site. It's, it's your name above the shop door. And then we have pattern libraries. You know, we're all saying, what, what pattern libraries should we use? What's going to support the business? You know, what, what do our developers know? We should really be asking ourselves, you know, which pattern libraries are inclusive? Which ones have accessibility baked in? Which ones have code that is already accessible and verified as being accessible? I do have a little bit of an issue with pattern libraries at the moment, though. They do tend to focus on code. 
a little bit on design, but they don't ever really tend to focus on what is the outcome for the end user? What is the experience for the end user? They don't include, for example, implementation notes. So take the accordion that we saw on the homepage of iPlayer. You can have that coded up in a pattern library beautifully. It could have heading level twos for the, for the headings, which is structurally, you know, that works for accessibility. But if you take that accordion out of the library and pop it in your page, that, that accordion might be further down the page in the structure. It might be under a heading level two already. Then the H2s in your accordion become invalid. So the implementation notes are missing. And that's something that we're building at work now. We're building a pattern library around accessible you know, widgets, et cetera. But we're building an experience. We're building in, you know, this is what a user can expect. This is what the outcome should be. Equivalence. Disabled people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with content equally and without barriers. Anyone seen Braille signage around here today? Anyone wondered how you would find Braille signage if you're blind? And what about those people who do find Braille signage, are blind, but don't read Braille? Of which there are a few. Braille is, you know, arguably dying out a little bit because... We have computers now. These are my colleagues. Carl Groves, Billy Gregory, a couple of reprobates, basically. But they run a podcast called The Viking and the Lumberjack, and they talk about all things accessibility. And here they talk about accessibility fails, and they're talking about Braille signage with the help of a couple of other colleagues, Steve Faulkner and Leonie Watson. Head across to a man's chest. It's C What is it <laughs> I love Leonie's face there. And yes, this is what we do all day at work. Um, so in terms of equivalence, I want to just zone in on um, subtitles. And I'm just going to disclaimer here. I, if I say closed captions, I mean subtitles. I, I work with a lot of American clients, so I get confused. My spelling is appalling as well. So in terms of uh, compliance, WCAG compliance, subtitles, captions must be this. Captions are provided for all pre-recorded audio content in synchronized media, except when the media is a media alternative for text and is clearly labeled. So to meet compliance, subtitles must A, exist, B, be synchronized with the speaker. What I mean by synchronized is, oh, Lord... Okay, you can't see that at all, but this is a, a screen grab of Stranger Things, and uh, Winona Ryder is in the middle, and she's got her hands wide open, and her mouth is wide open, and she's saying, you said 99 out of 100, and I can't lip read, but I know full well that that is synced with what she's saying. I can see her mouth, I can see her gesticulating. That is, that is synchronizing. If, if something is three seconds before or three seconds after, it can completely throw the meaning. Now, if you do these two things, you are compliant. However, is that an equivalent experience? We have on screen Newsoids, ITV player, and we have color coding for the subtitles. So different speakers, different, different colors. Instantly makes it so much easier to read. Cognitively, I am able to follow it. YouTube, custom styles. So we have um, YouTube up on screen, and the big thing is, is people have different needs when it comes to reading, don't they? We all need different font sizes, etc. One, one font size, one font colour does not fit all. And what YouTube do is they have, I think, three or four um, presets, so you can choose certain predefined um, styles, etc. But if that isn't sufficient, which is not going to be for everyone, you can then delve down into the settings and you can scale text up, you can use your own font, font styles, all of that kind of thing. Repositioning. Here we have TED Talks. The name of the speaker is at the foot of the screen. The subtitles are over the top. I can't read either of them. So, you know, potentially you sit through not knowing who on earth is speaking. BBC iPlayer encountered that problem. You see here the subtitles are all the way at the top. Well, they don't, didn't used to be. So when you, touch, when you touch your keyboard or when you mouse over, the player controls appear. And the subtitles move just above the player controls. 
But if the more menu is opened, as we see here in the foot of the screen, subs are pushed all the way to the top of the screen. Now, I spoke to some deaf users. We did some research on this, but I spoke to a deaf user beforehand, and he said it's very frustrating when you don't have access to both of those things. And I kind of, the way he kind of explained it is would be, you know, you're a hearing person at a conference, and let's say you're outside, lots of people are talking. The person you're talking to is the only person you can hear. You don't get the context and the background of what's going on around you. So you need to have the choice. And then you need to have captions which are understandable. <laughs> a tennis match, tic-tac, 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 whatever. I would say that's not particularly understandable, but also you don't need it. That's clutter. Interestingly, Ofcom in 2015 reported that 80% of subtitle users in the UK do not identify as having a hearing loss. Who here uses subtitles? Okay, so I would say sort of maybe a quarter, maybe a third of you. There's so many different reasons why we use subtitles. And actually, we verified this by doing stats tracking on the, um, uh, the subtitles button on iPlayer. And we found that a disproportionate amount of, of viewers were, in fact, switching them on and off. So we have situational disability and temporary disability. Maybe I am a mum feeding my child in the middle of the night, watching, um, watching iPlayer or something. Or perhaps um, you're uh, speaking in a second language. Or perhaps you're my six-year-old. She puts on um, subtitles because she's she kind of find, finding it fun to read at the moment because she's just started reading quite well. And also, it's something that um, she can put on when the adults are really noisy downstairs, which makes me feel old. Um, choice. Provide multiple ways to find content and complete complex or non-standard tasks. Multiple ways is the key here. Multiple ways is so, so important. And actually, that is a WCAG checkpoint. But we have here um, Netflix. And um, at the top, I've done a search for WHE. I'm beginning to write when or something. All the search results start populating within the page, which is great. Predictive search, fantastic. But as someone with reading problems or a screen reader user, I have potentially hundreds of results but I have no way to zone in on those results unless I finish writing the word. So there's a lack of headings here, because as a screen reader user, you'd have to just literally listen to everything on the page. And I can't remember whether this page kind of lazy loads or not, but that's another issue in itself. So Amazon, Amazon do quite a neat job with search and multiple ways. You start inputting your search in the search field, and the drop-down gives you immediately some options of different departments. Oh. Let's try that again. So the drop-down gives you um, a choice of different departments. So you can cycle down, you can tab down, you can read them. Different colour coding, which helps with legibility. So you load the page, and what do you get? Over 2,000 results. That's no fun if you're trying to filter through those. On the left-hand side, we have headings which are marked up correctly as headings. So a screen reader user can jump there. I can visually scan and move there. You have headings where you have um, uh, categories, brands, all of that kind of stuff. And this updates as per the type of product. So you make your selections. You, you filter down the results. And you can do this as many times as you want. So eventually, you go from 2,000 to what we have here, which is 244. You then can sort by relevance as well. So you've got multiple ways to zone in on the search result, which makes things a lot easier for people. So just remembering we're talking about choice. Beware of assumptions and be aware of context, something else that has been spoken about today. It's very easy to, to assume that a screen reader user is blind. You would be wrong. There are many people who use a screen reader who are not blind. There's people who might have poor eyesight. There may be people who have autism or Asperger's and they find listening really helps them focus on the page. I had a couple of friends literally visit over the weekend. I live in Brighton and they'd just been round Brighton Pavilion, which I absolutely loved. Victor is blind, Caro has low vision. And they were really delighted that when they got there, they could get their audio guides and they could start walking around. But the problem that they found immediately, not so much a problem for Caro, was that um, 
Victor, just, he, he, didn't really, he couldn't really follow the audio guide because it was very visual in what it said. It didn't speak to him because he's never had sight. So I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I'm going to read you some of that audio. Just for context, this is about when the pavilion was used as a hospital in the war. It can be difficult today to visualise the building as it looked 100 years ago. But as we follow the tour, imagine the, roo the rooms with their royal furniture and ornaments removed, and with lino covering the floors and boards protecting the walls, you'll have the opportunity to see photographs of the pavilion during, our time, um, during its time as a hospital. Visualise the building. You can open your eyes now. Imagine the rooms. See the photographs. For Victor, he, he doesn't have a mind map or an image of what a photograph of the wall looks like. But Cara was okay with that because she has some sight and she's actually quite a vibrant, colourful person anyway. They went back to the desk, they handed back their audio and that actual human being um, walked around the building with them and he told them stories and that was a way in for Victor. It's like, yes, yeah, story-based Story-based alternatives were fantastic. And he also let them touch. He literally took the velvet rope apart and let them touch mantelpieces and ornaments and things that people wouldn't normally be able to do. And then they told him that they are thinking about having some tactile models built. I have a problem with the, with the term visual design. It's misleading. It does not accommodate the uh, diversity and opportunity we have within design. I've also been thinking a lot about non-visual design, the design of data, the, 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 how you architect everything. So it, this can be expressed as structured data, so headings are coded as headings, so a screen reader can identify something as a heading. The same for paragraphs, lists, and so forth. But really, design is both of those things. It's inclusive design. Um, it's accommodating of both diversity and it's also making sure that you make no assumptions about things and you provide choice. Sian Abraham is a, a policy guy in, in New York and he happens to be a screen reader user and he said choice is a privilege, one whose luxury some of us don't have. He's a blind guy. Um, and actually I think we have an opportunity. The web is the, is the easiest medium to make accessible. It's easier than a building, it's easier than TV programmes, easier than radio. We can make it much more accessible than other mediums and it seems a shame that we're limiting people's choice. Control. Ensure the user always has control over content and can customise the display. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of uh, tools within our platforms, within our mobile phones that allow us to zoom or to change fonts and all of that kind of thing. And the point is, is within your designs, you do not want to suppress that. Suppressing zoom uh, is something that a lot of people working in responsive web design say, oh yeah, it's okay because we scaled it up anyway. But that's not sufficient. One size does not fit all. I mean, how many of you here do not use pinch zoom? Ah, okay, I rest my case. We'll probably skip the slide then. You, you need to have zoom. Uh, not just for legibility, but to be able to zone in on content. So we've got grey we links there, not as easy to see, so being able to zone in on it makes easier touch and interaction, so you're not hitting the wrong link and going to the wrong page. Also, for people with cognitive problems, Zoom is very useful because you can zoom content in and you can ignore all the animation that runs down the side of the page and can be really, really in your face. Fixed orientation. This is my friend Sam. He was 18 months when he uh, was in a car accident and uh, became, well, he just lost body movement from his head down. 18 months, just learnt how to walk. And here he is in his wheelchair where his head is strapped. Um, he can't hold his head up independently. And in front of him, he has a black box with two white things sticking out, which are switches. And just off screen is a tablet which is fixed in place on front of his wheelchair. And he uses the, um, the switches to navigate and to operate the tablet. Sam doesn't have a choice. He's not able to control the layout of um, his tablet. So if, so if you fix layout, he's stuffed. He can't use it. Autoplay. Who thinks autoplay is a bad thing? All right, so I would say, yeah, just under half of you. Who thinks it's a good thing? 
No one dares. <laughs> OK, yes, some hands go up. Actually, it, it's both. It's both. Um, traditionally, we assume autoplay to be a bad thing because it drowns out your screen reader and you can't hear what's happening. And that is correct. It is a bad thing. But um, what if you want something to autoplay and you happen to be a screen reader user? When I worked at iPlayer, two people independently said to me, by the way, I really don't like it. They were screen reader users. I really don't like it how I click on EastEnders and then I have to go through to the playback page. I have to navigate the playback page. I have to find the play button. I have to press play. I have to do all those things when really I just want to hit the link and get autoplay. Now that worked for those two, but what about someone who's a first time user of um, iPlayer? So for, again, you need to be thinking about, you know, people are, people are different, people are diverse, first time user, repeat user. So you need to offer choice. So we have, a, this is a, from the BBC News, and when you open the player controls, which happens when you touch it, you automatically have autoplay on and off. So you can, at any point during playback, you can opt in and opt out. Super nice and easy. When it comes to the end, you then have a countdown, which gives you a warning. And again, you can opt in and you can opt out. What I like about that is it gives you um, not only control over the page, but it gives you choice. You can opt in and out of autoplay at any point or at the end of something. Consistency. Use consistent and familiar design patterns. I think we all know that. Um, when it comes to accessibility, this has a slightly more in-depth um, concern in that uh, standard versus custom components can have a very big impact on how somebody experiences something. A standard component, let's think about iOS. Looking at the iOS UI library, a standard component will have accessibility baked in. Traits will be applied, so that's a role. So a, a button will be announced as a button. You don't have to go and put that code in. Uh, you just have to put the label in. If you build your own custom component for, say, a slider, you have to go and put all the gestures in, all the, all the right roles and all of that, and it just introduces, you know, the opportunity to muck it up, basically. We have a picture of um, a very early um, release of iPlayer Radio, and at the bottom we have a dial. I don't, I don't know if you can see it particularly well, but a dial, and underneath it is, is a, a menu, a horizontal menu. It's a really lovely design because that dial speaks back to the offline world, so there's a bit of familiarity there. I think also there's a good visual cue. You immediately kind of go, you're invited to kind of move the dial. So for someone who's not familiar with um, navigating, they, they're going to be pulled in. It was also technically accessible. Each of those buttons had a label that was announced to the screen reader user. It was also possible to move the dial by using a three-finger swipe which is the equivalent of turning a page. The problem, however, was the three-finger swipe, which is a standard gesture, if you're a voiceover user, which is a screen reader on iOS, um, was a standard gesture, but with a non-standard component. So screen reader users didn't know what gesture to use in order to get to the content that was off screen. And really, it's simple. This, visually, is fine, but treat it as a list so that you navigate it as a list, which would mean you navigate sequentially through it and round. Also with consistency, be careful of overdoing accessibility. I literally had a client this week say to me, since navigation is at the bottom, focus should start there. So we have on screen iOS, and you'll recognize Facebook. That was not the client. And what they were suggesting was the bottom menu, news feed, requests, etc. Because that was primary content, but at the foot of the page, they should force focus for a screen reader user, so they listen to those first before going to the rest of the content. Now, there's a problem here. If you are sighted and use a screen reader, it, it doesn't make sense to be at the bottom of the page and jump to the top of the page. Equally, as a screen reader user, you can navigate sequentially, but also you can put your finger on the screen and you can move around and do what's called explore by touch and hear everything under your finger. And that means you'd have a disconnect between what you're hearing with spatial navigation and, and with sequential navigation. So you need to have consistency across platforms as well, and I think that's quite important when it comes to your brand. Again, remember our um, Amazon example with the, with the search features. When you drill down onto iOS and you put it in your search, you get the same predictive search, you get the same output. 
you go to the search results page, you get the same filters and the same sort by. So it's recognizably Amazon, and I become confident that I can find the headings that I need. So even if I haven't used it before, I'm kind of familiar with it. So value. Features add value for all users, but some features add more value for others, which sounds very Orwellian, I understand that. But it's something that I think really you should be thinking about at all times when you're coming up with new designs and concepts. Filters are great because they help you zone in and focus on what you need. Grids and list layout. Some people, I've seen people with Asperger's and usability testing who cannot handle scrolling. It really puts them off. Um, so having a, a list view enables them to get more on screen. Other people with dexterity issues may want an image view so they have a larger touch target. Or perhaps they just understand images better. Wizards. Imagine a banking website with a thousand mortgages. Putting together a wizard will help you um, get your customers to understand and siphon through information. Same with data visualization. The data comes from somewhere. So present that data as structured content, maybe a data table, but use that visualization to help people with cognitive problems who, who are more visual in how they understand information. Continuing on the theme of search, we have YouTube, Just Eat, and Amazon. And when I'm thinking about adding value, think about you know, what does the platform have that we can use? So you might have the voice API which enables people who have um, difficulty using um, input uh, to, to use. You also have the geolocation API, API also known as the where am I API. Um, and then Amazon, again, it uses the camera and the voice API, which is really good, because imagine if you're stuck at home, you can't go shopping by yourself. All I need to do is scan you know, that can of baked beans or that crate of beer and uh, it can be delivered the next day. Last year, I was in the States. I bought a plane ticket. It got sent by email. I hit the link. It took me to my passbook. I then booked a cab, booked Uber. I then showed my phone and got through customs. How beautifully simple is that for someone with disabilities? You don't have to phone an estate agent. You don't have to use, you know, you don't have to go and print stuff out that you can't see. You don't have to get assistance um, to get a cab. All of those things. The principles of accessible user experience is all user experience. I mean, you might be sitting here going, what's this got to do with accessibility? Well, I think for me it's a sliding scale, as, as, we, as we saw with Colin, you know, things which can be a usability issue for many of us can actually be a barrier of access for some of us. So what I would like you to do when you're working on your projects as a takeaway is to consider disabled people when prioritizing features. Ask yourself, how useful might this be for our different types of diverse user? So how did we do with iPlayer? This is uh, not the first page that was relaunched after it's a um, couple of reiterations on but many of the issues that Colin encountered were fixed. Now, they weren't fixed because I went trundling off to the team and went, by the way, we need to do this. They were fixed because they understood they were usability issues anyway, but it meant that all of a sudden, Colin was able to independently use the page. So main navigation was, well, primary links were put into the main navigation. So we have channels, categories, A to Z. Everyone loves an A to Z. Um, TV guide and my programs. And then you've got clearly marked up headings. Today's picks you've been watching most popular, recommended for you. Now, I think they've switched this back, but initially um, we had it so that the programs were lists. So you didn't have 40 million plus headings in the page. So my colleague Billy was at a conference a while ago talking to his mate Johnny, Johnny Taylor. Johnny, another person who uh, was in a car crash, paraplegic, but doesn't have the use of his voice like Sammy did. Um, and they were, he was, Billy was stood with, with Johnny and a couple of other people, and they said, well, what is the definition of done when it comes to accessibility? 
And you know, they, you know, they, they, they know that WCAG is the framework and, and obviously that's where we need to go, but they know also that we need to go a little bit beyond that. And they were discussing us, and, Johnny, and Billy just turned around to Johnny and said, um, Johnny, when is something accessible? And he held up his iPad, well, he didn't hold it up, but he showed his iPad and he said, when I can use it. And I think that's the answer to the question, what do people want? What does it disabled people want? They just want to be able to use it. And they want to have a good experience. They don't want to have a black and white shoehorned experience down you know, a, a, a dull route. They want to be delighted. They want to complete tasks quickly as well. And that's really where we need to be pushing our design thinking. These slides are up on SlideShare. I, I have an annotated version up there with a few stories, but apparently SlideShare can't cope with the notes. Um, but if you're interested, you can always get in touch, and I will share them with you. Thank you very much. Microphone decided to argue with me. Okay, so there were obviously quite a few questions. Um, I'll try and get through a couple of them. I probably won't, won't get through all of them, um, just to keep everything on track. Um, where should we start? What impact do you think that um, chat and voice control will have an effect on accessibility, um, like iPlayer Play standards from Monday, and will voice and chat have an effect over accessibility? I think absolutely it does. I mean, being able to independently control stuff, like Sammy has had use of his voice, so being able to control things and do things, absolutely. But it's, it's one of those things where um, it's not a solution in itself, it's a value-added feature, because of course not everybody can use voice control. So somebody who is deaf might not be able to, to articulate particularly well, someone who just doesn't have use of their voice, like Johnny, he wouldn't be able to use it either. So it's a value-added feature that you need to offer in combination with other, other ways, multiple ways, to, to complete that mm. task. What has been your biggest challenge doing accessible user experience? That's not easy. <laughs> um, I think, this is a, I, I, I was thinking about this this morning, and it's an odd one. Um, the biggest challenge is equivalence and making things delightful and pleasurable to use. And I worked on um, J.K. Rowling's website many moons ago, built in Flash, so we had to make it technically accessible for screen readers, reader users. But the whole idea of the site was it was not a traditional site, it was a des her desktop with coffee cups and notes and things. And the point of the site was, as a user, you went and explored it and you found things and you, you won things and you'd add it to your scrolls and parchments. So we needed to come up with a way of labelling focusable elements that could be communicated to the screen reader user but without giving it away. So that was quite a challenge, although I'd say probably the most challenging part of that was I'd not actually ever read Harry Potter at that point. I had no idea what was going on. So yeah, that was a challenge. Uh, is there a line across where access accessibility for one affects desire for others? If one in 500 users requires it, is it needed? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Uh, one in 500, that's a lot of people. <laughs> I would say. Um, I think also it, it can affect design, but I think for, for me, I find that it, it actually pushes design further and makes people come up with better and more innovative designs. It, we have a client at the moment, and um, my main contact is French. Uh, he, he's a French guy, and I hadn't met him until a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, we'd all been working in Slack together in Jira, and Jira, and it was all a bit language barrier -y and a bit awkward. And I was like, God, what are we going to get? And he just turned around the day I met him, and he just went, It was very violent when I started working with you. Like, it was really disruptive. It was like, You just completely ruined our design thinking. And it's actually now, a few weeks later, he's come around, and, and he's like, I understand that hover states. Um, sharing information doesn't work and actually they're coming up with better ideas more inclusive ideas and it works on mobile as well so it's about pushing through I think if we can leave that idea that accessibility is a constraint and think about it more as innovation and opportunity then we can start doing some cool stuff Brilliant. thank you very much Henny thank you Cheers,